Well, good morning, friends, here on Sunday, the 14th of June to First Baptist Church, Grand Cayman. Wherever you're listening in from, we're delighted you're joining us today. This is indeed the day the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we come to worship this morning, we'll have some opening words from a psalm, and then we'll pray, and then we'll join with our choir in our song worship. This is what Psalm 55 says. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught at the voice of the enemy, at the stirs of the wicked, for they bring down suffering upon me and revile me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter far from the tempest and storm. Let us pray together. Our Father, we come to you in this, the day that you have made, knowing, Lord, indeed, that for some of us, we really do wish we had wings like a dove to fly away from all our difficulties, all our problems, and our maybe rising despair. But we thank you, O God, that we can turn our fears, our frustrations, and our inadequacies over to you, the true and living God. We thank you that the psalmist could talk about you, Lord, as a place of shelter, ultimately, not just his own shelter, but finding in you the grace and resources to get on through. And as we gather for worship today, wherever, Lord, we listen in to this service, we pray, O our God, that you would receive the worship, thanksgiving, praise, and adoration of our hearts for being the great and glorious and generous God you are, and that wherever we are, by the power of your Holy Spirit, because and for the sake of our Lord Jesus, you would meet with us today. Lord, so grant it, we pray, as we draw near to you, believing your promise that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. Oh God, draw near to us, we pray today. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we offer our praise and our petitions. Amen. And now let us join with our song worship together.
Now back to always that exciting part of our service, friends, when we turn to our inevitable notices. You can get most of these electronically, but for those of us who don't have that facility for whatever reason, I want to just highlight one or two things, if I may, before we bring ourselves afresh to God in prayer. Uh, firstly, from Right Now Media, again, there's all sorts of opportunities to get resources aplenty, but one in particular has been indicated to me. It's called Reversing the Racial Curse by Dr. Tony Evans. Culture and history must always be subservient to the Word of God. And so we can go to Right Now Media, the details of which are coming up hopefully on the screen, and if you haven't yet signed up for it, I would encourage you so to do, and you'll have a whole plethora of resources for these interesting and massively challenging days. And then specifically uh, for women, uh, there's a series starting off soon for which you'll need to sign up, and it's called Single Minded. If you're a single adult female desiring to pursue Christ in a single-minded focus, you're invited to join this community by emailing martha at fbc.org.ky. Hopefully that's coming up on your screen as well. The motivation behind the group is to encourage single women in their Christian growth, fellowship, and identity in Christ. The format and frequency of the group will be determined, of course, by those who sign up. And then there is also a Women's Weekly Word. Weekly encouragement for women by email will provide Bible-based discussion and study. If we have a current email address for you, you'll receive an invitation to sign up for these emails. And if you haven't let us have an email, but you'd like so to do, the same address, martha at fbc.org.ky, will get you into that particular loop. And then a forward notice, more in hope and expectation than being definite at the moment, is our annual Vacation Bible School. We're hoping that as government allows various meetings to take place and lockdown continues to be relaxed here and there, that towards the end of July, we may be able to run our VBS. So please uh, do follow that with your prayers the provisional dates, and they are very provisional at the moment, would be July 27th to the 31st, but you may want to mark that down in your calendars. And then a, a note of uh, thanks for the, those of you who continue to support the church here in your financial giving. We have great challenges at the moment within the church, the school, weaker, and out into our wider community. And uh, we are seeking to be good stewards of what God has given us, and also to be kind and compassionate to those who we know are caught up in real difficulties, who've lost their jobs, or finding it really hard to get on by at the moment because of the lockdown here on the island and some of the knock-on effects of that directly into their lives. So. Wherever we are today, we can continue to bring our offerings electronically is the best way, banking way through. But for those of you who are more local, it's possible to drop gifts here, of course, into the church office that is open through the week or by a prior arrangement uh, with Miss Neely, our, our uh, lady accountant, uh, and uh, her details are coming up now, nmoxham at fbc.org.ky and we'd be very glad to share with you in that uh, ongoing financial support for the work of God in and through First Baptist Church. And now, a prayer. Our Father, like those in ancient Corinth, we not only bring our gifts, but firstly, as the Apostle Paul reminded them, they gave themselves, and we give ourselves afresh to you, and pray that both our gifts and the gift of ourselves may be used in all that that means to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus. And so receive our thanks and take ourselves and our gifts and multiply them to the blessing of many, many people near and far. Through Jesus, your Son, our Lord, we pray. Amen.
A little earlier in our service, we read from the beginning of Psalm 55. I'd like to read the second half of that psalm to you now, as in a few moments' time we come to our meditations for this week, which I'm calling Death in the City. The psalmist says in verse 16, But I call to God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. He ransoms me unharmed from the battle raged and waged against me, even though many oppose me. God, who's enthroned forever, will hear them and afflict them, men who never change their ways and have no fear of God. My companion attacks his friends. He violates his covenant. His speech is as smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words are more soothing than oil, yet they are drawn swords. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He'll never let the righteous fall. But you, O God, will bring down the wicked into the pit of corruption. Bloodthirsty and deceitful men will not live out half their days. But as for me, I trust in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his word. Let us pray. Lord, in a confused and chaotic world, we want to say with the psalmist, but I, Lord, trust in you. And we are trusting you now as we come to your word that you would speak. For by your mercy and grace, we, your servants, are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Back in 1992, two UK Christians wrote a hymn that has a very contemporary feel to it, at least as we see what is being pumped into our screens, on our TVs, and other forms of communication every day. This is what it says. Great is the darkness that covers the earth, oppression, injustice, and pain. Nations are slipping in hopeless despair, though many have come in your name, watching while sanity dies, touched with the madness and lies. And then it's refrain, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit, we pray. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit today. We are indeed in a time of great darkness and mounting despair. Amidst all the turmoil of COVID-19, worldwide pandemic, we have also now seen the rise of racism, uh, the death of George Floyd over just a few weeks ago back in Minneapolis, and all the outpouring of grief and pain and sorrow and anger, the worldwide movement of Black Lives Matter garnering every day more and more people into lawful and peaceful protests, and then sometimes spilling over into violence, into crime, into looting, etc. We are living in a time of madness, of lies, and nations slipping in hopeless despair. Where is hope to be found? Where can we turn in such a time as this? Well, I'm so grateful that the Bible always speaks into our contemporary world because it is the Word of God that will endure forever. And this morning we're turning to Psalm 55. It was written 3,000 years ago, approximately, by David. And yet, what a contemporary psalm it is. For this is what he says in verses 9 and 11. And just think how contemporary these words are. For I see violence 
and strife in the city. Verse 11, destructive forces are at work in the city. In other words, as per our title for this morning, there is death in the city. Now, sometimes when we come to a passage like a psalm, we have a little title to it. So, just four psalms before, Psalm 51, if you were to turn to it, it gives us its context and its background, which helps us in its interpretation. So, if you turn to Psalm 51, well-known psalm, it says, for the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Now, there is a title to this psalm, but it doesn't exactly give us the precise historical situation. It simply says, for the director of music with stringed instruments, a masquil of David. However, if you go through the psalm and know something of David's life, you'll quickly begin in your mind to think that it surely is referring to that turbulent and terrible time in Israel's history and David's own personal life when everything fell apart. You see, David, despite being a man after God's own heart, had also fallen into gross and dreadful sin. He'd not only committed adultery, but he'd arranged the murder of Bathsheba's husband, his friend, Uriah. He'd been himself a betrayer of a man and his wife. And that course of events, his personal sin, brought all sorts of devastation into his family. And part of that devastation is recorded in 2 Samuel chapters 15 and following, where David, through his own folly, maybe not giving enough time and attention to his family, had primed a time bomb, a very out standing, outstanding young guy called Absalom, who stole the hearts of the people of Israel away from King David, his father. And the events of that time led not only to a general revolt, but a huge rebellion with David having to flee for his very life, fleeing from the city, fleeing from the city of God, and having to head for the wilderness so that he could be safe and eventually see things turned around. Here we are then in this this background to Absalom perhaps and his rebellion. If it isn't that, it will be something similar. For the psalmist is saying, I'm in a time of incredible crisis and I'm not really sure what to do. If you're in times like we so often are of crisis, it is not unusual these things happen And again and again, the Word of God, the Bible, comes to our help to say, it's okay. God's got this under control. We've written these things down, so you are prepared for such evil days. So what's specifically in this psalm as our, quote, takeaways for today? Well, the first thing I want to say is simply this. It's a question. Where's the problem? Where's the problem? And the answer is very simple. It's the city. I see violence and strife, verse 9, in the city. Verse 11, destructive forces are at work. Where? In the city. We know from our TV screens that some of the huge protests and then some of the many riots are focused on cities. Hmm. The word city in Scripture has a bit of an ambiguous and checkered background. When God made humankind, he made them for a beautiful paradise garden. But after what we call the fall, Genesis 3, as we turn into chapter 4, we read about Cain, who murdered his brother Abel, that he built what? A garden? No. He built a city. And by Genesis 11, we get the 
the awful human hubris of the Tower of Babel. And what was behind that was simply this. They said, come, let us build a city for ourselves and so we may make a name for ourselves. And you'll know that God knocked down their tower to reach to heaven. So as we go through the Bible, we find that this word city is a loaded term. At one level, it's about people who are in their organized rebellion, if I can put it that way, against the almighty God. It's saying, God, keep your nose out of our business. We don't care how tough it is. We can manage. We can do it our way. We can get by very, very well without divine aid or interference. It's not quite articulated as strongly as that, but that's the picture, the metaphor of what the city's about. Now, I say it's ambiguous because there's another city that's indicated in the Bible. Psalm 48 celebrates it. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Or Psalm 87, glorious things have spoken of thee, Zion city of our God. So to quote Charles Dickens' famous novel, the Bible itself is a tale of two cities, the city of humankind in its rebellion and its self-sufficiency, its keeping God out of the picture, I can do it, I did it, my way, and God coming in his mercy to establish another city, the city of God. And by the time we fast forward to the end of our Bibles, the book of Revelation, chapter 21, we read that the seer has a vision of, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, beautifully adorned as a bride for a husband, the city of God. And here comes the rub, and here comes the tension, because humanity's city and God's city are not the same, and yet they are often intermingled. The city of God, of course, is God's saving purposes, God's delight and his will to impose on the city of humankind in all its rebelliousness, his grace and his mercy, his forgiveness, and his transformation. <laughs> but here we are, we're not at Revelation 21, and we're, thank God, not back at the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11, but Christians are people who are caught in the milestone of be, being between the ages, the old age of the city of humankind, and the new age of the city of God. And Christians are caught in this in-between age, this present evil age, as Paul calls it in Galatians 1, where there's tension and difficulties, where we'd love to think that we could have paradise restored just like that. But so many are so aware that paradise has been lost. I think C.S. Lewis was so right when he spoke about this universal feeling of nostalgia. There's something in every culture, it seems, and every human heart at its best when we begin to think, have I got some kind of memory of better days, of, of, a, of an Eden period, of, of a, a paradise? Because that's where I want to be. Surely this world can be better than it is. And this is how C.S. Lewis puts it, that, that sense of paradise lost in the human heart. It's only the scent of a flower we've not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have not yet visited. It's that feeling in the human heart of, this isn't right, this isn't enough, that's wrong. It shouldn't be like this. Isn't that at the heart of the protests? Isn't that at the heart of so much that we hear on the media? This is not right. Why are things as they are? Can't they be, get, be, be better than they are? And some people say, well, that's just 
morality is just a, a social construction. You know, we, we just make it up as we go along and, and there's no ultimate right and there's no ultimate wrong. Uh, and we just impose that upon our children. And, really? If you want to know whether there's something in the human heart about justice or injustice, try this. Get one good toy that's attractive to a two-year-old and put two two-year-olds who are not related in the same room with the one toy and simply say, it's yours. And you know what happens? One says to the other, well, I think, George, it really is yours. I wouldn't uh, dare to think that that toy should be for me. And the other one says, oh, no, don't be so silly, Alfred. I really do think that that toy has got your name on it. So why don't we just, you know, maybe even share it? Is that how it happens? If you think it happens like that, you've never been around two-year-olds. No, before long, that's mine. No, it isn't. Yes, it isn't. Next thing, whack, smack, bang, wallop. That's not fair. Hey, let me sit you down, you two-year-old. What do you mean it's not fair? We live in a totally random, purposeless universe. There's no such thing as right and wrong. There's no such thing as justice. There's no such thing as fairness. You're two years of age. Isn't it time you got over yourself and realized that, that, that this world is completely chaotic and absurd? Well, you're the person who needs to be taken away, I think. There is something in the human heart that says, this is not right, this is not fair, this is not justice. And that's why anger can quickly flow from it. And, and the psalmist is facing this in the city. He knows there are dark and powerful forces at work, and he knows it's not right. It shouldn't be like this. It isn't the way it's supposed to be is one way to summarize the biblical teaching on sin and a broken and fallen world. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. But that leads us to a second consideration. And that is, so why the plea? For there is a plea here. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not, verse 1, ignore my plea. And then in verse 6, he will say, I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. As you go through these opening verses, you find him talking about not only wanting to run away and hide, but he's verse 2, he's distraught. Verse 3, he's aware of the enemy. Verse 4, his heart is in anguish. Verse 5, he's horror struck. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. And so his plea is, God, please get me out of here. In Star Trek speak, previous generation, it's uh, beam us up, Scotty. Take us out of here. We don't want to be here anymore. The city is given over to pain and abuse and violence. Now, allow me to say just a brief biographical word and then to give a disclaimer. I spent the first 20 plus years of my life as an inner city kid, an inner city Liverpool. And then I spent over a decade of my life as a pastor in the East End of London, very cosmopolitan and very inner city too. If you name it where we live there, if it was good, we had a low rate of it. If it was bad, we had a high rate of it. What were the forces at work in the cities that I've lived in? Well, people know them well. Crime. We had at least four burglaries when we lived in Hackney. In fact, we got to a point of thinking, if you find anything when you break in to our home, we'll go 50-50 with you. It was a, a place of criminality. It was a place of massive alcoholic uh, abuse, drug abuse, domestic violence, murders. When I lived in Hackney, there was at least one every two weeks. Prostitution, immorality, exploitation, religious and racial tensions 
big time, leading sometimes, as in London through the 80s, to various riots, and in my hometown of Liverpool too, various riots were taking place. There's unemployment, loneliness, poor housing, the sense of being depersonalized, you don't matter, you're just a number. And for many people, though they didn't always express it like this, just a sense of powerlessness. I can't change anything and nobody's going to change it. Now, let me tell you, and as a disclaimer, and say it loud and clear if I may, despite the fact that I've lived nearly half of my life in the inner cities of the United Kingdom. I have not got some massive, therefore, big insight. I have not got some silver bullet that's going to sort everything out in one fell swoop, save for the redeeming gospel of Jesus Christ, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. But what I do know, up close and personal, given my background, is that though there's no silver bullet outside of the gospel, it's always facile when people want to keep shifting the blame, and there is lots of blame to be shifted, believe me. I've seen all sorts of injustices close up and personal. But let me say this, that if we keep blaming politicians or the police or social workers, or your parents, or Tom and Dick and Harry for whatever's wrong in the world, we'll never get to putting it right. You remember the old joke, although it's based on the truth. In the Garden of Eden, when things went wrong, Adam blamed Eve, and Eve blamed the serpent, and the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. We're all brilliant at passing the buck to somebody else without in any way wanting to call controversy by what I'm about to say. Uh, many of you will be aware of uh, the woke culture. And uh, this is what uh, President Obama in a tweet said on the 29th of October this last year. As a critique of woke culture, he tweeted, this idea of purity and you're never compromised, and you're politically woke, and all that stuff. You should get over that quickly. The world is messy. There are ambiguities. People who do really good stuff have flaws. And we do well to remember that. I in no way think that what happened on the streets of Minneapolis, there is any, any justification for whatsoever. Like millions of others, my stomach turns over at the massive injustice and killing perpetrated on George Floyd. However, what I'm also seeing as I try to track the course of what's been happening is a rising tide of self-righteous hypocrisy. People often talk about the hypocrites in the church. The truth is we're all hypocrites. And all these folk now taking the high moral ground, and now let's deface ancient statues, and let's rewrite history and everything else. Oh, it all sounds such high moral ground. And so you've got no sin? And you're going to be the first to cast stones at everybody else, especially from history, where you've got no appreciation of the ins and outs, because, like, uh, my personal life is messy, and the city is messy. History itself is messy, because people are messy. And everybody, the Bible teaches, are sinners. And thank God we can be saved by the grace of God. But as I see the iconoclasm going on, I'm wondering how long it will be before the unofficial national anthem of America 
amazing grace is outlawed. Well, well, you know why, don't you? Because it was written by John Newton, a minister of the gospel in the 18th century. Yes, but you know he was involved in the slave trade. So now, as we're getting rid of monuments and everything else, why don't we get rid of amazing grace as well? Because it was written by a man who was a very wicked man involved in the slave trade, which he knew he had been a very wicked man. But listen very carefully. Amazing grace saves, he says, a wretch like me. And so often in these movements, folk on their high moral ground no longer believe in the possibility of forgiveness, no longer believe in what the Bible calls a new birth, a new life, new life in Christ. And yet at the heart of the gospel is this massive change that comes to the heart when the heart is changed by the amazing grace of God because someone has actually paid the debt so I may go free. That's the gospel. And although that doesn't therefore mean we do not have as Christians a concern, a massive concern for justice, we do because God is just, then also we better make sure that I say while we're casting stones at others, those stones are not coming back at us from others who think we too are in need of some self-righteous rectification. And so here in this psalm, there is a plea. He wants to get out of it. He wants to be away from it. He doesn't want to be there. We're living in this beautiful place of Grand Cayman. And he says, oh, that I might flee like a, like a, a bird taking wing. I might flee to a desert place. How many folk think, wouldn't it be wonderful to come to Grand Cayman and get away from it all? Because, of course, here we don't have any problems with alcoholism, with drug abuse, with domestic violence, with murder. Pardon? <laughs> this beautiful paradise, it is not a paradise behind all the superficiality and all the veneer. People are lonely, despairing, hopeless, abused and abusing. Sin is no respecter of location or your vocation or of your color of skin. Sin has affected every one of us is the clear teaching of the Bible. It's not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And here's the final consideration. Where's the problem? Why the plea? And what to pray? Verse 1 says, Lord, listen to my prayer. Verse 16, I call to you, O God. Verse 9 talks about, Lord, confound the wicked. Lord, because they are people who, verse 19, men who never change their ways. They are, verse 23, bloodthirsty and deceitful men. Now again, I'm going to be so easily misunderstood here. Do I think it's right that people should protest about injustice? Yes, I do. Do I think it's right that folk in Hong Kong should be on the streets protecting their democratic right to freely think and freely associate? Yes, I do. Do I think it's right that Christians' voices should be heard when there's massive injustice, etc.? Yes, I do. But I'm also a realist. Because, you see, my Bible teaches me this, that beyond the human, that are also, like this psalm reminds us, dark forces at work. Not just human forces. After all, the Lord Jesus told us that Although he came to give us life abundantly, John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Beyond the human that's happening in the protests, there are dark forces at work, and I don't just mean human forces. For still our ancient foe, says Luther in his great hymn, a mighty fortress is our God. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work his woe, 
His power and craft are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. That's why in the middle of the psalm, and again taken up towards the end, there is a dark betrayer at work. Christians inevitably have seen in this the pattern of Judas Iscariot betraying the Lord Jesus, and rightly so. But there are a betrayer at work in even the movements for justice. There are dark forces that push people to extremes and not only to petty crime, but maybe into pillage and far darker things as well that can become the madness of the crowd. Who urges some of that stuff on? Now, again, hear me carefully and clearly. I'm not saying, quote, this is all the devil. Don't want to give him too much credit. But on the other side, we forget the devil and his power to deceive and push people further at our absolute spiritual and and mental and emotional well-being and equilibrium. Here, the psalmist is pleading with God, and he does it in this way, in a verse that mirrors 1 Peter 5, 7, where it talks about casting all your care upon him, he cares for you. It says this, cast your cares, your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. The word burden there means what God allows. I don't know why God allows this and that and the other thing. Nobody does. But what God allows and what is God's good and pleasing and perfect will are not always the same thing. And there are things and pressures that come upon us God allows, but when he allows them, as I take those things to God, he, I'm told here, will sustain me. That's why the psalmist finishes by simply saying, but as for me, I trust in you. You see, we all now have choices. The psalmist in the natural says, Lord, when I look around and see what's happening, oh, that I had the wings like a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. But you see, when you trust in God, you don't fly away. You don't decide to find rest somewhere else outside of his endless resources in Jesus Christ. This is what Psalm 11 says. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you then say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? As he takes refuge in the Lord, he finds what he needs to go forward. And the church of Jesus, what can we mostly do and can do here in Cayman and other places not directly affected by what's happening in in our friends in the United States, in the cities, we can certainly pray and we can wait upon God and we can pray that the church, wherever she is, will indeed arise. They who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like doves, little tiny pigeons, They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. Great is the darkness that covers the earth. The pain, the injustice, all the wrongs. But it leads to the refrain right through that hymn we started with. Come, Lord Jesus Come, Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit, we pray. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, pour out your spirit on us today. And God help us all as we face death in the city and death in our own communities to be those who can say, but as for me, I trust in you. Let us pray together. Some further words from that hymn I've been quoting. May now your church rise with power and love. This glorious gospel proclaim. 
in every nation salvation will come to those who believe in your name. Help us bring light to this world that we might speed your return. Great celebrations on that final day when out of the heavens you come, darkness will vanish, all sorrow will end, and rulers will bow at your throne. Our great commission complete. Then face to face we shall meet. Come, Lord Jesus, Come, Lord Jesus, pour out your Spirit, we pray. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, pour out your Spirit on us today for your namesake. Amen.
Well, some final words from the end of Isaiah 40, one verse of which we've already quoted. It says this, the Lord gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even the youths faint and grow weary and young men fall exhausted. But they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God grant that by his spirit, you may walk and not be weary, that you may mount up with the wings of eagles. And for Jesus' sake, you see, he will see you safe through and safe home. God bless you and yours this day and always. In Jesus' name, amen.